All right, well, I'll go ahead and just kick us off then. Um, so hello, everyone, and thank you once again for viewing this webinar. Uh, my name is Marissa Pepongna, and I'm a project associate at the After School Alliance. Um, today, I'm filling in for my colleague, Dan, who coordinates the administration of the New York Life Foundation's incredible AIM High grant program, um, alongside a few other members of our team, including Aaron Hegarty, who is managing today's uh, Q&A and chat in the webinar. And just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Please enter any questions you have throughout the webinar in the Q&A box. We know that many of you will have questions during the limited time we do have together today. So the FAQ section of the RFQ will be updated with any unanswered questions. Um, also another note, this webinar will be recorded. A link will automatically be sent to your email if you registered for the webinar. Um, if you or another colleague did not register for the webinar, um, it will also be available on our website. Um, and another note too is that our current Zoom platform only allows for 500 attendees. So if you have a colleague who is unable to join the webinar via Zoom, um, they can attend the Facebook live stream of the event, um, the link for which will be made available in the chat. Um, and the last housekeeping note is um, to please change your chat settings to make sure that all your chats go to all panelists and attendees. I think the default uh, setting is to all panelists, but to make sure everyone can see your questions, please change it to all panelists and attendees. And today's webinar presentation will feature two speakers. Uh, in addition to myself, we are also super fortunate to be joined by Marlene Torres, Senior Program Officer for the New York Life Foundation, um, and who is one of the chief architects of the AIM High grant program. So to give you a quick look at the order of operations for today's webinar, the agenda is included here. Um, Marlene will be starting us off with a quick overview of the AIM High grant program, its goals, and how it fits in with the New York Life Foundation's other investments and out-of-school time programming. Um, then I'll build off of this with a few other notes and reminders, and then we'll be moving on to our tested and true tips for um, applicants to the AIM High grant program. Um, I will then provide a quick run through of the most common questions that we receive from applicants um, and then give some general feedback from our experience with managing previous rounds of the AIM High grant program. Um, and then lastly, I will give a few couple notes uh, and reminders for applicants and then we'll open up the floor for your questions. As mentioned earlier, the question and answer portion of today's webinar will be managed through the Q&A box. Um, we will do our best to get through as many of your questions as we can. Any outstanding questions you have after the webinar ends, um, as mentioned, we will update the FAQ portion of the um, PDF of the RFP. But you can also feel free to email us at aimhi at afterschoolalliance.org. That email will be displayed on the Q&A slide at the end and is also available on our awards homepage and in the PDF of the RFP as well. And with that, I'll be heading over to Marlon to give us a big picture view of the AIM High Grant Program. Thank you so much, Marissa, and welcome everyone to the webinar. It's always great to see when folks introduce themselves and to just see the representation all across the country. So that's wonderful to, to see. So thank you for joining us today. I'm, ex I'm excited to share with you today information on the Foundation's AIM High program. To provide some background, the AIM High program supports out-of-school time programs that support middle school students and helps prepare them for specifically for the transition from eighth to ninth grade. Research has shown that for disadvantaged students, more learning time in the form of high quality after school and summer programs leads to greater academic achievement, better school attendance, and overall more engaged students. AIM High is now in its fifth year, and this year the grant program will provide over 1.35 million in grants to out-of-school time programs. 26 awards will be made nationwide through a competitive application process, um, which we'll go over in more detail in the upcoming slides. And to give some perspective, last year we received 542 applications for 26 awards. So I don't say that to dissuade you, but just to provide some context of the uh, competitive, uh, competitive nature of the RFP. In the next slide, I will cover a bit about the, our middle school OST focus. So the AIM High program complements the foundation's ongoing national investments supporting out-of-school time programs that work with middle school youth. 
Our mission as a company is to provide financial security and peace of mind through our financial products. And these values are aligned with the work that we do through the foundation. Again, research shows that students who get to ninth grade on time, prepared and on track, are four times more likely to graduate from high school. This important step puts students on the right path to, for academic and financial success. Since 2013, the New York Life Foundation has invested nearly 60 million in national middle school OST efforts, supporting organizations that provide thousands of middle school youth with after school and summer learning programs. So AIM High was created to support local and smaller programs that fall outside of the scope of our national level grants. This RFP helps us broaden our investments and helps us reach more communities across the country. We look at programs that can track, measure, and report against what we know are key success indicators for, uh, to support a young person's success in high school. These factors include academic performance, school attendance, on-time graduation to ninth grade, and developing strong social and emotional skills. Now, with that said, we know that many programs um, this year were disrupted due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. So the information that you usually track for your students perhaps will not look the same as in past years. It may be incomplete, um, it may look different, you may have started tracking different indicators but what's important to remember is to please tell us what you were able to track and share um, what you were able to do in this regard. So as I mentioned, COVID-19 uh, impacted a number of OST programs. So it's important for us to pause and reflect on the moment and acknowledge this impact that COVID-19 and the pandemic has and continues to have on schools and out-of-school time programs. We know that out-of-school time programs and the youth, families, and communities that you all serve, um, you've been facing a number of challenges in the wake of this pandemic, including coping with loss, experiencing financial hardship, navigating in-person or virtual programming, and dealing with the um, restrictions of the COVID-19 safety guidelines, and so much more. So we acknowledge the unique ways that programs such as all of you who are on the call today have been able to pivot to meet the immediate needs of youth and their families. Applicants are encouraged to share the ways in which they have continued to support youth in the wake of the pandemic, as we all work together to ensure that youth continue to have these opportunities to grow and thrive. Uh, at this point, Marissa will walk us through some of the specifics of what we're looking for in the RFP and will provide tips in drafting the best application. Uh, but before I turn it over to Marissa, I just want to point out a new aspect of the program for the 2021 cycle. So this year, the 10 awards of the one year $15,000 grant category will go to support projects that focus on racial equity and social justice efforts. The New York Life Foundation recognizes that we are living in a pivotal time and it is imperative for us to continue to build on our legacy to support and provide support for marginalized communities and communities of color as part of our ongoing commitment to support an equal and just society. Understanding the unique role that after school and summer learning programs can play in addressing equity, the 15,000 one year grants are dedicated to supporting programs in their efforts around advancing racial equity and social justice. At this point, I'll turn it back over to Marissa and um, 
we'll, I'll, you know, I'll still be here to answer questions throughout the presentation or later in the presentation, I should say. Um, so I wanna first and foremost, thank all of you for all the work that you do with your um, young people and your families in your communities across the country. We look forward to reading your applications, learning more about the work that you're doing in your communities. It's such important work. So I just want to give a heartfelt thank you. And with that, I'll turn it over back over to Marissa. Marissa. All right. Thank you, Marlon, um, for the introduction and for also the incredible work that the foundation um, has done to make the AIM High grant program possible. And also definitely echoing your heartfelt thank you to all programs and program providers for just meeting the moment and just doing everything that programs can do for communities, families, and youth during this time. Um, and I guess to just start us off with a overall timeline, um, I wanna quickly run through just the bullets that are on the screen here, just to make sure you all know exactly what to expect going into the AIM High grant application process. Um, as I'm sure you all are aware, the AIM High RFP is currently open and will remain open until 5 p.m. Eastern time on Monday, February 1st, 2021. The review process will include a diverse set of experts from the out of school time field alongside experts in youth programmatic strategies for promoting racial and social justice as well. Um, the vetting and review process for the grant will take between three to four months to complete. So you can expect to hear back from us about the status of your application in May of 2021. Um, for grant recipients, there are two possible grant periods. The grant period for both of the two-year grants will begin in May 2021 and end in May of 2023. The grant period for the one-year grant, which is focused on supporting programs and their efforts around advancing racial equity and social justice, like Marlon uh, mentioned in the previous slide, um, that will begin May 2021 and end in May 2022. Grant recipients for all three grant categories will be required to submit progress reports throughout the duration of their grant period around every five-ish months. And then just going into general eligibility requirements. Um, first off, all applicants must be registered 501c3 organizations. That includes schools and school districts. Um, if a school or school district is not registered as a 501c3, unfortunately, um, they are ineligible to apply. The second requirement is that applicants must either currently serve middle school youth or must use the AIM high grant funds to begin serving youth in this age range. For the purposes of the AIM High Grant Program, youth are considered to be middle school aged beginning the summer before sixth grade and ending on the first day of ninth grade. The third requirement is that applicants must serve low income youth. So in order to be eligible, 75% or more of the youth served by the applying organization must be eligible for free and reduced price lunches. And then lastly, applicants must not currently receive funding from the New York Life Foundation, either directly or as a pass-through funding from a parent organization. If you have any questions about the eligibility requirements or want to know details about what exceptions may exist for any of these rules, um, I would refer you to the Appendix D of the RFP, which includes an FAQ for questions like these. Um, if you have any questions that are not addressed in the FAQ or during the question and answer portion at the end of this webinar, um, I would once again encourage you to email us, uh, email us directly at aimhigh at afterschoolalliance.org. So this year's AIM High grant program will include uh, $1.35 million spread across 26 separate grants to out of school time programs. Um, and this chart that you see here on the screen can be found on page four of the PDF of the RFP. So in this year's RFP, similar to last year, we have three different types of grants. Um, we have eight two-year grants for $50,000 per year for a total two-year grant amount of $100,000. To be eligible for these grants, you must both have an annual organizational budget of more than $500,000 and an annual program budget of at least $250,000. The second type of grant um, is another two-year grant, and we have eight of those as well, um, and that's $25,000 per year for a total two-year grant amount of $50,000. To be eligible for these grants, you must have an annual organizational budget of at least $250,000 and there's no minimum program budget to be eligible for these grants. And the third type of funding we have are um, 10 one-year grants for $15,000, which is focused um, again on helping programs improve the supports they provide to youth related to social justice and racial equity efforts. 
Uh, for the purposes of the AIMHI grant program, both organizational budget and program budget will be defined by annual expenses rather than revenues. Uh, the budget that you should use to meet these eligibility requirements should be from the most recent completed fiscal year. Um, and then moving on to the next slide, I'm going to quickly run through the eligible use of funds for these grant categories. So for the two-year grant funds, um, as mentioned, there are two different types of two-year grants, but for both of those, um, aim high grant funds may be used for either technical assistance, enhancing direct service activities, or both. Um, for the purposes of both of the two-year grants, technical assistance includes things like program enhancements, operations enhancements, and governance enhancements. Funds may also be used for enhancing direct service activities, capacity building, um, and or program expansion should a program be in a position to do so uh, with a specific focus on supporting programs efforts to continue to serve youth in the wake of the COVID-19 pandemic. So some examples of direct service components can include things like addressing the unique needs of youth arising from the pandemic, developing or improving virtual and in-person programming, and enhancing programming to better support students' transitions to ninth grade. Um, these are just a few of the many different examples um, and eligible uses uh, for these grants. Um, I do wanna stay up front that AIMHI grant funds for all three tiers are not to be used to support programming that happens during the traditional school day. Um, furthermore, it is specifically intended to support middle or support programming for middle school aged youth, excuse me. Um, for the purposes of the grant, youth are considered to be middle school aged starting when they leave school on the last day of fifth grade and ending on the first day of ninth grade. Um, like the two-year grants, the one-year grant funds um, may be used for either technical assistance, enhancing direct service activities, or both. The acceptable Direct service components are the same as the two-year grants, but the one-year grant funds have a slightly more restrictive usage of the technical assistance funds. So for the purposes of the one-year grants, unlike the two-year grants, um, the one-year grants um, do not, cannot go towards um, operations or governance enhancements. So technical assistance for the one-year grants does not include operations or governance enhancements. Um, they do have or still include program enhancements such as supports that help your organization implement practices that address racial equity and inclusion, program initiatives that engage youth in creating youth-led social justice and civic engagement solutions to local challenges, programming that helps youth thrive in the face of trauma related to racial and social injustice and historic disparities, and training for program staff on anti-racism, racial equity, diversity, inclusion, and healing-centered engagement. Um, and as always, if you have any questions about eligible uses of funding, feel free to reach out to us at aimhi at afterschoolalliance.org, and we'll attempt to clarify anything um, that you might have some questions about. So now that you've gone through the ins and outs of the grant, uh, we are now going to go into providing recommendations and suggestions. The tips, recommendations, and best practices that I lay out in this portion of the presentation are drawn largely from the Alliance's long history of reviewing applications for grants and awards. So we're gonna go ahead and go into our top five tips for you going into the RFP. So the first tip is that all questions have a purpose and at that, a unique purpose. You should approach every open-ended question as an opportunity for you to explain and illustrate the value of your program. Um, we encourage you to make sure to read the full RFP before writing your answers to gain a better picture um, and better understanding of what reviewers will be looking for in each question and kind of just seeing how the different puzzle pieces work together. Um, when you read through the application in advance, um, you not only see the specifics of what question it's asking for, but also, like I mentioned, how the questions throughout fit together and give you a good understanding of how to approach each question and maybe build that narrative. The second step is to be an advocate. It's vital to give reviewers a complete picture of the amazing work that your program um, accomplishes and does every single day. Make sure to share details on how the program is helping to meet the needs of its community and what makes your program so great. When available, it can also be great to find the places within the application to demonstrate your program's impact quantitative and or qualitative data, um, but just make sure that any data you're providing is relevant to the question that you're answering. Um, and keep in mind that our reviewers don't just want to, you know, have you make a list of program activities and outcome data. Um, it's kind of your role as an applicant to bring the program to life for our reviewers. Um, reviewers become more attached to programs that not only provide descriptions of activities and data based on the program success, but also give them the information that they need to really understand the day-to-day -day experiences of the youth that are in the programs. And then going into our third tip, provide specifics. 
Details really do matter. Um, we rely on your application to give reviewers a complete and concrete picture of your program. Um, it's really important that you don't assume that reviewers know anything in particular about your program, curriculum, or community. Uh, we, as mentioned, we have reviewers um, from a diverse range of expertise. Um, and so it's great to just provide as much detail and as much context as possible. Um, if you have great outcomes data or a strong answer to how your program addresses a specific prompt, reviewers rely on you to convey that information in a compelling way that helps them understand the true value that your program brings to youth and to your community. And the fourth tip is to keep it relevant. Um, in any grant application, ambiguity is the enemy. Um, make sure to be clear in your answers and always keep in mind the specific goals and priorities of the RFP um, and the intent of each question when answering. Um, it can be tempting to describe all the great things that your organization does and the impacts um, that your organization, organization has, excuse me, outside the scope of the given grant opportunity. Um, but for the reviewers, every single word is this opportunity for you to give them pertinent information that addresses the question at hand. And not only is keeping it relevant helpful for you as an applicant answering questions with word limits, um, but it's also helpful for reviewers to just be able to easily identify the point that you're trying to make. And the fifth tip is to just read, reread, have someone else read, and then read through the application again. Um, I think we all have definitely been there that moment when you press the send or submit button and then immediately notice a typo. Um, we definitely know this application has a lot of questions <laughs> and requires a lot of narrative and um, different parts to it. So um, it's great to review your application multiple times before submitting your answers just to make sure it is um, the best it can be and really accurately and fully portraying um, all the work that your program does and all that your program hopes to do with AIM High Grant Funds. Um, it can also be great to ask your colleagues or even someone outside of your organization to review your answers prior to submitting your application. A uh, fresh set of eyes is great for both finding those little errors that drive us crazy um, and for also finding places where you can fortify your application by providing additional details or context. Um, and then another reason for having someone else read your application is to help you avoid jargon. So it's important to make sure that your answers to the questions in the application are clear and concise and just have all the context that um, they need. And so before moving into the FAQs, um, I just wanted to give a quick reminder to y'all about how to approach two particular questions within the application. So within the RFP and in the application system, we have provided links to um, downloadable sample charts and downloadable template charts for you to refer to for your answers in both section D, project description and expected outcomes, and section F, budget and narrative. Uh, the sample charts give you a good idea for how to fill in the details of a high quality answer for both questions D1 and F1. Um, you'll need to upload both of these documents once you fill them out um, in the application system using the templates provided. Um, if you are a previous applicant, this is a new feature for section D, but the same feature for section F. Um, we just thought for both sections, it'd be easier to have a, an upload. So hopefully this new feature for section D uh, is easier for applicants um, to fill out than in previous years when you had to fill up a chart within the application system, because we know uh, formatting was just a little difficult with that, so we wanted to make it easier for applicants. So section D and section F will both be um, downloads. And just going into some common questions now. So I will be going quickly into the answers to some of our most frequent questions that we receive about the AIM High Grant Program. Um, for your reference, most of these questions and answers can be found in, in Appendix D on page 42 of the full RFP. So going into one of the first common questions, um, how many grants will be given? So there will be eight grants of $50,000 per year for a total uh, two-year grant amount of $100,000. There will be eight grants of $25,000 per year for a total two-year grant amount of $50,000 there'll be 10 one-year grants of $15,000. Um, and then another common question we get is are nonprofit organizations that are not 501c3 eligible to apply? And the answer is no. Unfortunately, only 501c3 organizations are eligible to apply. Marlon? Thank you, Marissa. And we're gonna tag team this section <laughs> on common questions. So in another common question that we get is, can multiple programs or program sites from the same organization submit applications separately? The answer is no. 
Each organization as determined by the organization's EIN, that's the tax identification number, can only submit one application. However, if an applicant is an affiliate of a national organization, more than one affiliate is able to apply for funding so long as that affiliate is currently not receiving grant funds from the New York Life Foundation. And, you, and if you're an affiliate, you would verify that with your national office. If an organization has multiple affiliates or regional entities with distinct EIN numbers, one application may be submitted for each. This question comes up a lot. And if you have a nuanced question to this, again, uh, feel free to uh, ask that. And again, the email to send questions if we don't get to all of them. Um, and afterwards, if after you've reviewed the RFP, some come up, it's aim high at afterschoolalliance.org. And then another common question we get is, are organizations with annual budgets of less than $150,000 eligible to apply for any of the grants? And no, they are not. Um, the minimum organizational budget to be eligible for the grants is $150,000. So in continuing to build on that budget question, is it the program budget or organizational budget that will need to meet the budget requirement? So for the one year $15,000 grants and the two year $50,000 grants, it is the full organization's operating budget from the most recent fiscal year that determines eligibility. For most organizations, this will be the final fiscal year 2020 budget. For the two year $100,000 grant category, the applicants must meet the budget minimum for both the organizational budget and the program budget. And again, take time to look at the RFP um, on this specific uh, question. And the main reason for this is that um, after feedback from prior years, this was, we were able to better direct applicants to the grant categories that um, would be best suited for, the, for them to apply based on organizational budget size and program size. Marissa? Mm -hmm. yep. And then another common question we get is what is the geographic scope of the grants? So applicants will be accepted from anywhere within 50 states and the District of Columbia. Applicants from US territories are ineligible to apply. Um, and one quick note is that the New York Life Foundation does reserve right to provide an additional five points to certain applications based on the location and geographic distribution of applicants. Marlon? So are school districts, schools, and, and or government agencies eligible to apply? So only if they are registered 501c3. Um, so for example, in New York, the Fund uh, for Public Schools is a 501c3. It's the fundraising arm of the New York City public school system. In that example, that 501c3 entity, that nonprofit entity that raises funds for the school can apply. Can 501c3 organizations serve as a fiduciary agent, fiscal sponsor, fiscal agent, um, or programs run by organizations that are not 501c3s. No, the 501c3 organization must be the applying program provider. And again, if you have a specific question, a nuanced question, you can email us um, regarding the nonprofit status. But hopefully, some of these um, have been able to ask, uh, excuse me, answer some of your questions. Marissa? And then um, the final common question we have is, can I get a recording of this webinar? And yes, this webinar is being recorded. Um, the link will be sent to you via email. If you did register for the webinar, you will automatically receive an email um, with a link to the recording. And the webinar will also be posted on the After School Alliance's webinar page. If you go to our website, there's a webinars tab and you can click on that and you can find it there. Um, and I also wanna provide a quick note because I know perhaps some folks joined late, but um, if you do have a colleague who, um, was unable to join via Zoom because we were at max capacity. Um, They're able to join via Facebook Live. Um, and I believe 
Um, Aaron or Chandler on the chat will be dropping a link to that as well. But just a quick note too, because I know we're getting closer and closer to the Q&A portion, which I know um, is kind of the reason a lot of you all join aside from just wanting to get an overview of um, the AMI grant program. And just before going into the Q and A, um, I did want to provide some feedback from the past years, just to keep in mind and help to supplement some of the top tips that I provided earlier. So just to give a super quick synopsis of our feedback from the first three rounds of the AIM High Grants, um, just applications and distribution. So the first three rounds or a few rounds of the AIM High Grant Program, uh, we received a wealth of high quality applications from all over the country. Um, hundreds of applications are submitted each year from all across the country. Four years, we have now given out 96 grants to out-of-school time programs. So um, definitely important to double check everything uh, to make sure your application is top-notch and can't stand out from the crowd. Obviously, we know you all are doing incredible work um, always, um, but the scope is um, that last year we did receive 542 applicants um, and received 20, and they out of those applicants, um, 26 were uh, awarded. So just some things to help keep in mind. Um, and then also just reiterating that reviewers who will ultimately be reading your application are um, on your side. If it were up to us at the Alliance, Marlin and her colleagues at the foundation or any member of our review panel, we would love to see each and every applicant receive the funding that they need to continue to support youth. Um, but unfortunately there are only 26 awards. So the reviewer's job is to narrow the field and we are not going through and picking favorites so much as we are trying to provide objective scores to each section of the application, weighing them according to a rubric that is aligned with the point values that were provided in the application itself. Um, so your role as an applicant is to provide both answers um, that address all the different aspects of the questions asked and to also provide that bigger picture um, and details throughout the application that give reviewers the information that they need to not only score your application highly, but to also really advocate for and promote your application in discussions with other reviewers. And then another thing we noticed um, from previous rounds was that applicants that did best typically made a really compelling argument that they were a good fit for the stated objectives of the AMHI grant program. So this included applicants that specifically addressed the eighth to ninth grade transition and applicants that focused their answers on benefits and services provided to middle school aged youth as opposed to elementary school or high school. Um, we noticed that for new and kind of quote unquote young programs or those just starting out with middle school youth, they often had greater challenges standing out. So if your program um, is in that position that is not to discourage you in any kind of way, but just I think um, showcasing the fact that it would be a little helpful or more helpful to provide and illustrate as much as possible just how you intend to use those funds and how this new program that you're intending to fund um, really does align with the goals and objectives of AIM High. And then lastly, the number one reason that applicants lost points in the first round was when their responses to questions left aspects unaddressed. So if you do have so-called plug and play development language on hand, um, it's important to take the time to tweak it to ensure that it's a good fit for the specific AIM High grant question. Um, and then to also make sure it matches the specific aspects of the question that um, you need to address. So it's definitely fine to include details outside the scope of the question, as long as those details are one, aligned with the question itself, and two, um, your response addresses every aspect of the question as it is posed. So it's important to recognize that when you admit a response to a particular question, the reviewer has no way of knowing that it is oversight on your part or if you or your organization genuinely do not have a good answer to that particular question. Um, and by leaving out those details, you're leaving that determination up to the reviewer. So we definitely recommend providing as much context as possible and making sure to address every single aspect of the question as possible or just explaining um, why your answer might be the way that it is. So um, definitely a recommendation. And then just quick things to remember because I know we just went through a lot of information. So before going into the q and A, I I just wanted to take a second to highlight some of the most important things for you, you to remember as you prepare your applications or finish preparing your applications um, to submit for this year's part. So quick things to remember, due date. So applications must be submitted by February 1st. Um, that should be 2021, not 2020. So I apologize for that edit there, but 2021 at 5 p.m. Eastern time. Um, another thing to remember is to draft, edit, and review. So download the application, review the questions, and draft your answers with time to spare. 
Um, make sure your questions provide clear answers to the question they correspond to. Many of your questions have um, some like subtext and some additional guiding questions. So definitely take those into consideration when constructing your answers for each question. Another, another thing to remember is that data matters. These strongest applications often include robust program data, both qualitative and quantitative. Um, again, when including data, make sure that's relevant to the question at hand um, and making sure that that data is really supplementing what you're already including in the narrative for the response to that question. And also just don't assume um, reviewers will be unfamiliar with your programs. So providing detailed information will help reviewers gain a stronger understanding of the sports your program provides. And um, again, just wanting to make the case for, you know, how your program um, and your plans for the, the next like, year or two, depending on which grant you're applying for, how that aligns with AIM-HIM. So those are just a few quick things to remember. Um, and we will now um, open up the webinar to your questions. Um, please note that um, we will only be addressing the questions that are included in the Q&A box. So any questions or lingering questions you have, please be sure to enter there. Um, and as mentioned earlier, we know we have limited time with you all today. So any questions that are unanswered will be um, included in our updated um, FAQ section of the RFP. So uh, be on the lookout for that. And also any questions you might have that you either have now or later on, feel free to email aimhi at afterschoolalliance.org. Um, and we'll make sure to get back to you as soon as we can. So with that, I guess we will go ahead and open it up for some questions. So I will go ahead and pull up a few questions. All right. So one of the first questions I'm seeing is for the one-year grant, how does your organization define marginalized? Um, Marlon, would you want to speak to that question? Sure, in terms of, and it, it, it's a broad definition, Marissa mentioned two factors in terms of um, that your program serves 75% students that qualify for free lunch, at least 75%. Uh, percent. So that would be one of the indicators for that. Um, I don't know if there were specific indicators that the person asking that question was referring to, but it would be in terms of the uh, federal poverty level. Um, and I, I think there were other questions that came up about um, if you don't collect that information, um, you know, you'd have to make your best case about what you do collect and how do you know that those um, program participants um, would qualify for that. Um, so that's uh, related to, the, to that question. Thank you. Um, and then a second question I see here is, if we do not track low income from free and reduced price lunches, how can we provide proof of low income? So one of the uh, guidance that we, or one of the pieces of guidance that we provide to applicants who don't have that um, is that for um, the exception to the free and reduced price lunch rule based on the availability of uh, FRPL data in your area, um, this would include you creating some sort of proxy to measure the FRPL rate. Um, so that would allow you to estimate the number of low income youth served. Uh, we have seen some applicants provide median or mean family income of youth served, while others have provided family income data available from schools in which they operate or whose youth they serve. So I know that's kind of general, but they want to give a few examples of how programs in the past who don't have FRPL data or free and reduced price knowledge data, how they have measured that. But um, there is some kind of proxy. If you are not sure whether or not like your proxy, quote unquote, um, would deem you eligible, or if you just want to double check with us beforehand, again, feel free to email aimhigh at afterschoollines.org and we can let you know whether or not that works. Um, and we can perhaps provide you some more examples with how programs have done that in the past. Um, Um, and so the third question I see here is, if our program serves K-12 students but has a large population of middle school participants, would we be eligible or must we only serve middle school students? Um, so my answer to that is that the funds must only go to the program that serves the middle school students um, and making that really clear in your application. 
Um, so we have seen, and I know some organizations, some programs have multiple programs that support K through 12 or even like middle school and high school, elementary and middle school. Um, but again, these funds are to be only used to support the middle school transition to high school. So um, if you have specific programming or a program that specifically serves middle school students within that program or organization that you have, um, then that would be, you would be eligible to apply as long as those funds, the AIM High funds would only go towards supporting the programming for middle school students. Um, and Marlon, I don't know if there's anything else you wanted to add to that, but. Um, yeah, so to build on what you said, so we know that many programs serve a range of um, ages, um, elementary, middle, middle or high school, like Marissa said, but the programming is specifically for middle school youth. So you can have a program that serves elementary and middle school youth, but this is really to enhance um, what you provide to the middle school youth. Um, that, that is our focus um, because we know that that age, those grades tend to have the hardest um, at time in terms of um, finding private and public funds. So that's why we focus there. Um, I have a question. Um, that came up in the Q&A um, box. It says, we're partnering with a large after-school program to provide additional engagement opportunities and we'll be requesting two years of support. Should we include the full program budget, which is much larger beyond the proposed program elements for a budget just for the program components we are proposing for aim high support. So you'll spend some time looking at the, pro, the budget template, but we would wanna know the whole, and then you carve out and say, this is this larger initiative we're, we're part of. If we receive an aim high grant, it would support this portion of it. So we do wanna get a better sense of the whole, but you'd have to be able to separate that and carve that out and say, this is what aim high would support that would give us a better sense of what the funds would be used for. Great. And then I'm seeing another question here is, our organization is fiscally sponsored. Are we eligible? So I think in short, if your, if your fiscal sponsor is a 501c3 and also meets the eligibility requirements for all the other grant funding, then, and if your fiscal sponsor does exist to support your organization and your program, then yes, you would be eligible. Um, but again, if you have any questions or, cause I know some fiscal sponsor, fiscal sponsorships can be, there's like more to the picture and more to the more context that's needed there. So again, feel free to reach out to us at aimhighafterschoolalliance.org with kind of background of um, the dynamic or relationship. If you have any questions about that or if, you need some more clarity on that and we can definitely get back to you um, as well. I have another question. Um, if applying for the one-year grant, may we apply the funding to general operating expenses or must we separate out those aspects of the program that specifically focus on racial and social justice? So it's specifically for those efforts that focus on racial and social uh, justice projects. So it's not a general operating support grant. And we could just tag team the questions. <laughs> yep. There's like over a hundred questions. <laughs> so we'll yes, skimming through it. Um, well, I think Marlon, I think, I think this is a good question. Um, I don't mean to put the, throw it out to you, but I think it's a question that we get often, especially through monitoring emails, but one question is just, what about universities? If our university is a 501c3, will we qualify? Um, sure, and for representatives on the call today that are uh, part of university systems, uh, just to highlight, um, you must be a direct service provider of after-school programs or summer learning programs, so you must actually run um, those programs. So I'll say that to preface this answer. Um, so um, if, if, if they're a 501c3 and you are a direct service provider, um, you can provide that. Um, if it's a fiscal sponsor of um, an after-school program, was that the question? Say it again. Marissa? So 
the, I think the uh, person who asked the question was just seeing if our university is a 501c3, will we qualify? So I think it's more of just like a general question. Yeah. Yeah, so you must be a nonprofit. You must be a 501c3. Yes, that's the first level. Do you provide after school and summer learning programs? You know, that's the next level. So, yes, you must be a nonprofit, 501c3, as designated by the IRS. Great. And then we have another question Can an organization submit applications? for multiple locations under the same tax ID number. I'm assuming that maybe somebody's asking that is part of a national affiliate um, and they are part of a local um, affiliate of that national organization. Um, so we do get this question a lot, especially from national affiliates, which is why I'm making that assumption there. Um, so as long as your local affiliate does not, like, so if your org organization or national affiliate, for example, were to receive AIM High funding or funding from the New York Life Foundation, that is something you would have to just double check to make sure that your local affiliate or organization did not receive those funds that were just trickled down the way eventually. Um, but we do run into that tax ID EIN number question quite often, especially for programs of national affiliates. Um, so in the SurveyMonkey system, which is where the application portal is um, located, they only register like certain EINs like in the system when you're entering it in. Um, so if you are part of a local affiliate and there is only one EIN, um, but your local organization is completely separate from like another one, um, but there's only one EIN at the national level, then just email us at amhighafterschoolwines.org and we can try to manually submit it for you or just make sure that you are eligible in the first place. Um, so that is a general overview. I hope I didn't make that too confusing, um, but generally if your location is separate from another location and you just happen to have the same EIN because you're part of a national affiliate, then just email us and let us know um, and we'll work with you on an individual level to one, determine your eligibility and two, just see if how we can best submit that. Um, since the SurveyMonkey system really does only like allow one application to be submitted with one EIN. So we'll work with you individually on that. Marissa, I have a question that's mm -hmm. come up from different um, callers is about, um, so I'll paraphrase because I've seen it a couple of times now, in terms of programs that may be operating now during the school day because the schools are closed, but they're assisting their students, they're providing some programming to their students who they normally would serve in after school or during summer. And now that in some areas out of school time is all the time, they're stepping in to support their schools. So yes, you can apply and you'd be eligible again, as, you meet, as long as you meet all the other criteria. Um, so you tell us basically, um, you know, this is where details are important. Tell us your story, tell us, you know, my program historically, you know, ran this way. Now this is how we've stepped up. This is how we've pivoted our programs. We have, I don't know, some uh, programs have uh, learning pods that they have during the day for some of their kids. Some, some programs are providing, you know, maybe more academic support than they may have in, in the past. So tell us your story in detail and how you've pivoted and how you continue to serve. So even if your program is operating during the day, but you're typically, you know, you've historically been an after school or summer learning program, tell us, you know, how you're, um, how you've had to adapt and change your program and your plans for the future. So what you're doing now, and then as, as things hopefully continue to normalize through a summer learning program, what does summer 2021 look like? Um, if you're an after school program, you know, how are you continuing to help support your students? What's a priority? So I, I wanted to mention that because it came up uh, a couple of times. Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, and I think Marla, just like to add to your response too, I think from the reviewer standpoint too, just making it really clear, just the distinction between like your program or and like the school day, just to make sure that for reviewers, they're not thinking that you're like directly like providing that school day learning or anything like that, just to make it really clear for the reviewers that this is in line with AIM High um, funds and this is just in line with the program objectives. Um, just because I think after reading a few applications, it can be a little confusing at times. So just definitely emphasizing to make that as clear as possible and definitely echoing Marlon, just 
making sure to explain that and really illustrate like what's going on um, with your program in that area too. Mm -hmm. um, I have a, uh, another question. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Did you ask one from your list from your? Oh no, go ahead, Marlon. <laughs> It says our social justice and racial equity interests are in organization wide capacity efforts that will impact middle school programs, but also others we run. Or do we have to restrict training, for example, to middle school staff only? So definitely tell us if you're um, involved in a organization wide effort around um, social justice and racial equity, you know, tell us what you're doing, who you're working with, how long you've been involved, you know, tell us your story. And then as an OST provider, how that um, in part is enhancing the middle school youth programming. Is it having more youth led activities um, in civic engagement? or some other kind of community service, like what's your thinking about that? So it's great that it's part of a larger effort, but yes, we have a focus on middle school youth. So how would that component fit into that larger um, organizational goal? Okay. Um, and then one question that I've seen come up a few times too, um, in this chat, but also in previous years, can funds support pilot programs or only existing programs? And the answer is they can support both. Um, but like I mentioned earlier in our presentation today, um, we find that for just new programs or programs that already exist but are trying to pivot to middle school, it's sometimes hard, um, or we find that they have kind of some more challenges with I think, making the case. And again, that's not to discourage, but I think that kind of just emphasizes the fact that um, really making that alignment with, with what you hope to do with the funds and aim high grant um, objectives um, and like the purpose of the grant. So um, both can, are more than welcome to apply, um, but I would advise just for pilot programs, just what we've seen in the past, just really illustrating like what you hope to do. And I think also really centering your answers on the program, because I think sometimes in those applications, at least from what I've read, they talk a lot about like the program's history and like what they do with maybe youth who, or maybe their high school program and now they're trying to branch out to middle school, but sometimes it's kind of harder to get some more information about what exactly their hopes are to do, like if they were to be awarded the funding. Um, so definitely making that case for, you know, why um, the pilot program should be supported and how it's gonna be supporting the middle school to the high school transition. Marilyn, was there another question that you saw that you wanted to answer? Sure. There are so many. <laughs> That's yeah. a loaded question. <laughs> uh, right. Um, should organizations undertake a new initiative with New York Life Funds or should they look to expand or enhance an existing effort? So everyone's under a lot of strain. Um, so we're not looking for new programs. We're looking, let me hear, hear the whole answer. Um, if you are already thinking of expanding to serve middle school youth, and this is where your organization is going, great. That you know, continue to move forward if that was your identified priority. But don't think that oh, I'm gonna you know serve middle school su students now because that's what New York Life wants us to do um, to get this grant. That's likely not going to be a, a, an application that will probably necessarily jump to the top. Um, so it's not that we're looking for new programs. If you already position to expand and this is your moving forward, of course. Um, so that's how I would answer that question. And then another question that has been coming up a lot is just what kind of geographic locations get that five extra points? So it's definitely a question that we get um, every single year that we do this. Um, and the answer is that the list of states that receive the five bonus points um, for all three grant tiers, um, yeah. it's not yet available. I don't know, Marlon, did you want to talk a bit more about that? Yeah, so just to build on what you said, um, it's we try to focus in areas, if we find that there's areas in the country that have um, less support um, based on our in internal information, and I don't have those states, otherwise I... Would, would share them to try and get programs from those states to apply. But when we do have them, um, 
we add them so that we add those five points to states from to applications from those states that were identified. So it's an effort to try to provide additional resources to some states where um, we don't have a lot of investments in. So that's the purpose of that. So we don't we don't have that as yet. Um, but just you know, if you have a strong program, apply. So wherever you are. Um, Um, another question that I saw come up was just, will, will we be able to see examples of past successful applications? Um, we do not share that out or make that public. Um, however, um, any questions you might have for just wanting clarity on a certain question, um, wanting to make sure that like you have a full understanding of the question and the purpose of the question, again, feel free to email mhighafterschoolalliance.org um, and we can, we're more than happy to just help provide clarity on anything that um, might be a little more ambiguous um, in the application, but unfortunately we do not post those. Um, so that is the answer to that. Um, Marla, do you have another question that you've seen pop up a few times? Um, well, I'll, I'll just read the one where that, that I have here. Um, do you have suggestions on how to stand out from other applicants given the high number of applications you receive? So to emphasize, um, Marissa, from some of the top five tips that you went over, um, you know, use, use clear, direct language, jargon-free language, you know, tell us your story. What's, you know, your, your, what is it? What's your... What makes you different from other programs? How do you, um, you know, provide help to your program participants? So really, tell us your story. What makes your program different? How are, you know how are you going above and beyond during this time? Um, I know it seems like a simplistic answer, but really, it's you'd be surprised in terms of applications that. Um, you know, don't really describe what they do. Um, so I would emphasize that again. Um, I don't know, is there another one on your end, Marissa? Yeah, um, and I just wanna say, like, I definitely echo what you're saying, just kind of just really showing what your program does. I think if a viewer can walk away and kind of have a sense of like what the day-to-day -day looks like, how using your program feel and just like what they're gaining from the program, that's just, like awesome. So definitely echo what you said. Um, and this question that came up, and I think this might be one that if you folks have questions about just knowing how um, much COVID has impacted everybody. Um, and I might pivot this one to you, Marlon, but um, if the 2020 budget was below the minimum, but the 2021 budget will be above it, are we eligible to apply? Yeah, that's, um, that's a tough one. Um, I guess, I guess reach out to us um, and we'll have to take it uh, on a case by case basis to see, because in terms of the sustainability, um, you know, the AIM High uh, grant program, we have one year funding and then we have the two categories with two year funding, um, but it's, it's not viewed as a long term um, funding component of, of your programs. So we just want to be sure that if the bump in the program was due to something COVID specific and that funding won't be around next year, you know, we're really looking towards the sustainability of the organization. So that's how I'd answer that question. But, you know, reach out to us and, 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 and tell us why. Um, and I, I guess similarly, if your budget was bigger and because of COVID, it just plummeted, but you're back on track, you know, in the financial section of the proposal, and I know we're at time, so I'll close out with this, you know, tell us why, how COVID has impacted your financial um, situation. Um, and then we'll take a closer look at that. So that's what I would say regarding uh, budgets. Marissa? Yeah, well, 
I know we are right at three o'clock and I know everyone's time is precious. So we will wrap it up here. Like I mentioned, I know there are a lot of questions, especially about stipends, you know, whether funds can be used based stipends for students, about subcontractors and a bunch of other topics. So we definitely have that. Aaron has been a rock star and <laughs> keeping note of all the many questions. So huge thank you to Aaron and Chandler as well and Charlotte for helping us um, just manage and facilitate this webinar. We hope you have found um, just tips that have been helpful and just hopefully are walking away with a clear um, overview of what to expect with AIM High and just what, also what the viewers and us we are expecting as well. So thank you all so much for your time. And like I said, a webinar of this recording or recording of this webinar, excuse me, will be sent out to all of you automatically if you registered. And if you weren't registered or have a colleague who wasn't, um, the recording will be available on our website as well. Um, and we will be updating the FAQ with all the unanswered questions um, that you received today and making sure that you have the answer. But as mentioned, anything you might have, anything you might need clarification on, anything you just wanna double check, feel free to reach us, uh, reach us at aimhigh at afterschoolalliance.org. Um, and thank you all so much for your time today and best of luck.